morning ladies and gentlemen welcome to my channel rahu and ketu study part 8 so one more thing about rahu and ketu these are energetic points which are always in the same axis just to recap 180 degrees apart so it's we are talking about an axis really and think of it a rahu ketu axis always as if you hold a torch light in if you are in a dark room okay and if you are holding a torch light and directly pointing in front of you into a dark space trying to find out what is where right in a dark room it's pitch dark the torch light is the ketu point and what it is shining on is rahu at the opposite end what is looking at so think of it like a torch light the point of light rests in ketu and it shines outward like a like a cone of light into the opposite direction this is another analogy i just came to me this is how rahu and ketu behave okay so ketu is where it brings in wisdom from past lives ketu is where it shines more the dispositor of ketu the closeness to the cusp of the ascendant the nakshatra all of these things are basically giving you more and more more and more details adding more and more layers of the behavior of ketu in any chart and so is rahu at the opposite end rahu is where the light is being shown on and this is how you got to use it that's the hint right there okay so you got to use the aspects of ketu which you already do have and you got to bring it towards rahu which it wants to achieve in this lifetime this will create the balance of light and dark in your life meaning rahu wants to over amplify something ketu ketu wants to over shrink something so this over amplification over achievement expansion over expansion and this over shrinkage withdrawing from everything going away from everything shrinking down of ketu come into balance when one is being used with the other they only are the two ones that can balance out each other when there's too much of rahu go towards the ketu side when there's too much of ketu go towards the rahu side and this happens automatically by the way you don't have to sit and do something you don't have to sit and silently pray 20000 times a day it is happening anyway what this channel attempts is to bring you a consciousness to the astrology isn't but only if you engage with it consciously can you determine these things and understand these things of how they are working why they are working the way they do what if i do this what if i do that become a student of your own chart become a student of your own life this way you will find things far more easier to go with in your life this will explain a lot of things it's like a puzzle you are trying to uncover the puzzle we are just doing this kind of studies in this channel that's all we are doing we are trying to understand self and the direction of self so if you're new to my channel please like share subscribe it <clears throat> because i'll be posting so much more content keeps coming in fact my hands and brain cannot keep up with the kind of stuff i'm getting <laughs> sometimes it is hard for the physical body to catch up with what the mind is getting isn't it and if you are already watched the previous series i encourage you to watch each and every one of them it doesn't matter what where your own rahu ketu is in your chart because each one i get a newer insight about the rahu ketu itself the middle portion of this i will give an introduction to the rahu ketu which i am covering in every video and if you have seen the introduction of rahu and ketu you just can skip fast forward this video to the point where we get to that pie chart and we'll analyze by pada by each and every pada okay take a be safe keep watching so number 1 the classical characteristics of rahu and ketu as described by the classical vedic literature okay what is rahu and ketu these are the north and the south nodes of the moon found by the virtual points which are the intersection points between orbit of the moon around the earth and orbit of the earth around the sun so basically if you take two ellipses ellipses it will form two intersection points yeah so these two intersection points are called the north node and the south node they are virtual nodes although they behave like planets and we shall see why in a minute so who is rahu 
the symbols are there like a horseshoe and the reverse horseshoe right this is typically how it is portrayed in western astrology so i'm using the same symbol here rahu is mythologically depicted as the severed head of a demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable hunger and appetite be it sensual or physical yet it is unable to hold on to or grasp it rahu is the one who constantly wants something think of it as a live head only not the body okay so it can't hold on to anything or be satisfied even if it gets that thing since it has no arms or body or stomach right? just a head which is alive this gives rahu the title of bhoga karaka or meaning one who is after sensory materialistic pursuits so think any earth sign for example they want sensory materialistic pursuits or think any of the signs literally whatever they are after rahu wants that and wants that very badly and goes after it with everything this is an energy in us by the way it is not a planet it's a virtual node but it will behave like a planet which we shall see why so it is unable to satisfy that hunger or hold on to anything even though it gets something it wants to move on to the next and then to the next and then to the next this is why varahu is also called as the guy who wants foreign things not of the native land or not of what the person is natively born in why because of that insatiable hunger there is always insatiable hunger to go after one thing after the another without being able to hold on to it that's rahu ketu on the other hand is mythologically depicted as the severe body the remaining half of the demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable search for identity it is looking for the head but it doesn't have a head so it is looking for that identity everybody's identity ego is centered in the head what you look like right it is also seeking for true purpose sense of self as a result of this it tries to hold and grab on to everything that it can find its hands on because it has got hands ketu has got hands it's trying to hold on to everything but it releases immediately because it knows that's not the head it's like trying to grasp on to everything thinking Oh, I want this, or I am this, I am that, I am this. Not getting any identity because it's not finding the head there. Since it has arms and walks everywhere, it goes around through life, walking from place to place, people, situation, circumstances, but not knowing who or what it is. It doesn't have a head. This is why Ketu is referred to as Moksha Karaka or the seeker's path, the one energy in us which seeks something. that's why ketu is called the moksha karaka now this is the classical interpretation okay now we shall see how this plays out in the modern interpretation very important to connect the bridges now here you have the rahu ketu general characteristics as modern interpretation this i have borrowed from the book a light on life by robert so was a excellent book i have put it in the community tab if you want to go through it or purchase it and read it i seriously suggest that okay the north node of the moon rahu what does it become because of the characteristics which classically is told in the texts what does rahu lead to in the modern context rahu is responsible for originality individuality independence insight ingenuity inspiration and imagination on the positive side because rahu and ketu both love to explore foreign stuff things out of the box things not taught by tradition rahu and ketu will be anything but traditional okay think of it as something foreign to the culture to the way you are taught things looking for original stuff if there is one singular force that is responsible for creating everything that we keep modernizing so to speak thinking out of the box it is this that's why it's important to pay attention to this okay back to this so rahu on the downside becomes leads to confusion escapism neurosis psychosis deception addiction vagueness illusion and delusion this is the downside now how this plays out and why we like to see individually in the charts we will just will see that okay ketu ketu the guy with only the body no head there is gives us the feeling of universality impressionability idealism intuition compassion spirituality self sacrifice subtleness on the positive side on the down side it can lead to eccentricity fanaticism explosiveness violence unconventionality amorality 
iconoclasm, impulsiveness and emotional tensions. This is on the downside. This is what it plays out and Rahu Ketu is typically an axis like it is shown over there, right? Rahu Ketu, let me remove myself for the time being from that axis, okay? There you are. So you see it as an axis, okay? 180 degrees apart. And it can play out in any one of the opposite houses. It can play out in 1, 7, 2, 8, 3, 9, 4, 10, etc, etc. We will see that later. But this axis becomes a definition point of where in your life, in your different houses, are you looking for these two aspects? And they are always opposite to each other as you can see. Okay, to stand opposite to each other. So if it plays out in second house, it detaches itself from the eighth house. If Rahu is in second house, it, Ketu will be in the eighth house. You see what I mean? And so you will bring the eighth house aspect with these aspects shown here. Second house with that aspect shown over there. Of course, it plays out with something called as dispositors. We shall see that next. Now, if you go to a traditional Vedic astrology, they will go on and on endlessly about dispositors. What the hell is a dispositor? It's an invented term by the Vedic astrologers. It has no meaning of its own. It shows the disposition. And what's the story on this? Rahu and Ketu both are enemies of the sun and the moon. This is the basic principle. So it has the solar aspect and the lunar aspect. The solar aspect is called the dispositor. And the lunar aspect is the nakshatra. Which gives the entire characteristics and the ball game of Rahu and Ketu. Okay? The solar or the dispositor means since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the sun and do not have a full identity of their own. Remember, it's a virtual node. It is not a planet. They both do not have any planetary characteristic individually. So they take on the identity or the disposition of the lord of the zodiac sign that they sit in and borrow the attributes of the house from which that lord sits in. Suppose Mercury is in the third house. Okay. And Rahu sits in the house of Mercury somewhere else. So it will borrow the attributes of Mercury sitting in that third house and bring it to that particular house wherever Rahu is sitting in. Got it? Nakshatras. Since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the moon and do not have a full identity of their own, Individually, they take on the shade of personality. Nakshatra is essentially a shade of personality. It's coloring of a personality. It's seeing the world through different colored glasses. That they sit in and borrow the nakshatra traits and attributes which color their propensities. So Rahu and Ketu do two things at the same time. At the solar level, it goes with the dispositor. That is all of the planets, physical planets. Mercury, Mars, Venus, Sun, Moon, so on. So they take on the attributes of whichever house they are sitting. If it sits in Rahu sits in Cancer, it will you have to look for where Moon is sitting, which house, and what it is doing there, and even the Moon Nakshatra. If it is sitting in Leo, Rahu in Leo, that means it you have to look for where Sun is sitting and which Nakshatra and which house. So it will bring those attributes. That's the way you have to analyze this. Okay. Let's see some aspects of which house they play in and why. Now there are some vital aspects that you keep, need to keep in mind when evaluating Rahu and Ketu because this is important for, especially for people who are sort of looking for self-development to understand where they are coming from. If you are not interested in changing yourself, this entire channel is useless for you. But if the other one who is interested in knowing what is happening in my life, where do I need to go, what are my talents and you question these kinds of things, excuse the noise somebody is drilling about. So, then you need to understand these aspects. Now that's the typical chart, Indian chart. And house numbers are depicted as 1, 2, 3, 4, up till 12. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha is there. And I have stuck Rahu Ketu as possible axis on the 1, 7. That is Aries and Libra, that is the top and the bottom. So either it can go to house number 1 or 7. Rahu Ketu can be reversed, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Or in 4 and 10. Now 1, 4, 7 and 10 in Vedic Astrology are given very vital importance because they are the foundational aspects that define who you are, that define how you operate in life, throughout life. So these become crucial. Why? The 1, 7 axis effects if Rahu and Ketu fall on there, 
has a direct effect on your self and other concept one in seven is self and other how you re- relate to yourself and how you relate look at the world around you as others including the spouse because seventh house is the house of the spouse but also others so how you develop through life and how you develop a relationship with others so it defines who you are in a very broad sense one seven axis of rahu ketu the four ten on the other hand, fourth house being the house of the mother, tenth being father, fourth being home, tenth being career. You see, this has a you know all kinds of implications, which define who you are. The four ten axis has effects on the heart versus mind. Mind wants to, is the one who goes out there in the world and being used in the career, right? You dissipate your energy as the mind in the external world. Heart is your home, your home center where you feel comfortable. Home is where the heart is, that kind of a thing. So heart and home is affected by this Rahu Ketu axis. Again, Rahu and Ketu might be reversed. Rahu might be in the fourth, Ketu might be in the tenth or vice versa. Same way with one and seven. But these are the vital relating aspects of Rahu and Ketu. Now what about the rest of the houses? Now rest of the houses are called Trikona or Kona in Sanskrit, right? These are the things that come and go in your life. Let it be second house, third house, fifth house, sixth, eighth, ninth, eleventh, the twelfth. These are the things that come and go in our life, through life, through your entire life. These are things that are added into, subtracted from us. But this is not us. One, four, seven, and ten is us. Everything else is secondary, which revolves around you as life comes and goes. All other axes depict what attachments and detachments we have towards different areas of our life. That's all it is. They are less significant in terms of Rahu and Ketu when compared to 1, 7, 4 and 10 axis of Rahu and Ketu. Please remember this. When you're evaluating, you just have more propensity towards one part of life and less towards others. Rahu is attachment, Ketu is detachment. Rahu is expansion, Ketu is reduction. And they stand opposite to each other always. Right? Now let's take the cases one by one. So now we are talking about Rahu in Uttara Ashada Nakshatra, which falls most of it, as you can see on the pie chart mark there, is in Capricorn, and only the first pada falls within Sagittarius. Okay, and it's even there on the table that Dharma pada falls in Sagittarius in Natal, going into Sagittarius in Navamsha in Uttarashada and in the second one Artha going in from Capricorn to Capricorn so this has got two Vargottama points which are very important meaning Vargottama meaning whatever is there the position in birth chart is the same in the Navamsha okay so the the themes become very dominant of Sagittarius in the first Pada of Capricorn in the second Pada for the Uttarashada Nakshatra First order of business, what is the dispositor and what sign is it sitting on? Rahu in this case is still in Capricorn. We are still in the Cancer Capricorn axis as in the previous one in part 7. So, first of all, Rahu and Ketu do very well in movable signs. Capricorn is a movable sign and so is Cancer a movable sign. Because Rahu and Ketu need room to move and grow. They are moving energies. They can't be made to sit still. In any place they come in a chart. So they do very well when it comes to moving energies. These kind of uh, people become very dynamic in nature. They want to get stuff done and they move to get stuff done. It provides them the energy. Rao Ketu provides them this energy to do so. What happens now in the fourth Pada of Uttarashada? We are beginning, remember, in the reverse direction, which is Pisces in Navamsha and Leo. In, uh, the Ketu is in Leo in the Navamsha in the Pushya Nakshatra in Cancer. First, let's see what the themes are there. So, we are talking about Saturn and Moon once again. We are talking about the mind and heart once again, Capricorn and Cancer, the dispositors in the natal chart. And in Navamsha, in this case, the dispositor becomes for Rahu, Jupiter, and for Ketu, it becomes Mercury. Cancer going into Virgo, yeah. So it becomes the play between understanding something, wisdom, and intelligence in the Navamsha later on in life. When they become mature, they will think more about: Do I need this more? 
I need to do this more intelligently. I have the talents and the intellect and capacity for doing this thing, thing logically. But I'm kind of detached from it because Ketu is there. But they want are driven more towards the emotional intelligence wisdom part of it, Pisces. Jupiter in Pisces is more like emotional intelligence. Yeah, because it's a moksha sign. So they want to go there and it becomes active like that in this case, right? You got to see the theme of Uttarashada now. Uttarashada is what? Purva Ashada, the previous one, which we'll get to the next one, is about going after victory. Purva Ashada, Uttarashada is all about victory, but Purva Ashada is about going after victory, getting victorious, while Uttarashada is about maintaining that victory final victory what is the final victory we are all seeking the final victory will always be of light over dark that's the final victory and Uttarashada wants to maintain that that's why it's a very powerful nakshatra to have these people will want leadership positions they will want materialistic stuff it's a Capricorn ruled uh, zodiac sign falls under most of it yeah at least the last three padas so it becomes very driven in practical terms. In the last pada, however, it becomes more of emotionally wise person, this Rahu. It wants to seek emotional satisfaction in doing things rather than going after being earthly stuff. Mercury in Virgo is the highest exalted sign of Mercury. You got to see where Mercury is placed in which house and so on, the dispositors. So that's what it does in the fourth pada. Let's see the third one. So in the second pada, we see it's going into Leo Aquarius axis, right? So Leo Aquarius axis in the Navamsha, what does it mean? Leo Aquarius axis is about self and others. Now it's both are fixed signs. It's the tussle between the father and the son kind of energy, right? So dispositor in Ketu becomes the son. So Ketu with the energy of the sun becomes something very ancestral in nature for all you sensitives if you want to take note and it's falling in the Dharma axis meaning you're bringing wisdom from past life okay your ancestral support ancestral energy and that Ketu that torchlight you want to be shining onto the Aquarius bringing it to the masses bringing it to the collective so in the initial stages, these people might be driven, initial stages meaning the natal chart, they might be driven in Capricorn by a need to wherever Saturn is placed, like I want to do this and this, the work, Saturn is the work, the worker. So they might want to be driven by that. And in the later stages, they might want to graduate that particular need and going into giving it for the masses. And this can become powerful in terms of leadership, leadership roles. Uttarashada is very good at maintaining leadership roles because it's Capricorn, right? It's falling in the sign of Capricorn. The work to be done, the work for the masses, right? You will see especially this when we come to the second pada of uh, Uttarashada, which is Capricorn going into Capricorn. Now Capricorn goes into Aquarius, which is all about the masses. So they might be in leadership positions of government. They might be in leadership positions of top companies. This will be very good for that access. And Rahu sitting there wants to amplify, wants to go unorthodox ways, liberal minded, independent thinking, expansion of that. Right? It will give that energy to Saturn to go towards it and make it happen. This is the cru crucial part you need to understand. But they need to do what here? Because most ignored in every chart is always the Ketu, the Moksha Karaka. In this case, you need to bring the wisdom and the support of your ancestry. Always remember your ancestors. The indigenous on every civilization knew this. The indigenous in this land knew this. Whoever wrote the Vedas knew this. That's this particular axis. Now let's take the first and second pada, or second pada and then the first pada, because these are very interesting. These are Vargottama padas, and they behave very differently. We shall see that. Okay. Now in the third pada, or the second pada of Uttarashada, we are talking about the Artha and Moksha axis, as you can see marked between the two tables. 
So here Ketu takes the light from Cancer to Cancer, Vargotama of Cancer in Punar Vasu Nakshatra, going towards Uttara Ashada in Capricorn to Capricorn. So Rahu is in Vargotama in Uttara Ashada and Ketu is in Vargotama in Cancer in this axis. Very, very interesting. And the best way to figure this out, what I just received, is Punar Vasu's themes versus Uttarashada's themes. Punar Vasu has got the thing of return of the light, winning the second time, losing first time and winning the second time. Always winning the second time. Meaning they have a repeated theme of attempting something in the first attempt, losing it, not working out. But if they do it the same thing the second time, they are going to win or they are going to become successful. That's the theme of Punar Vasu. Look up my Punar Vasu Nakshatra. I will link it up here for you, the 27 Nakshatras. So you got to see the theme of Nakshatra, how is it plays, playing out with respect to Rahu and Ketu, where the unorthodoxy comes into play, where the liberalism comes into play. So Rahu and Ketu in this axis, <clears throat> especially Rahu, in Capricorn to Capricorn will is all about the Saturnian means, all about working for the masses, all about achievement of success, maintaining of success. Uttarashada is of maintaining of success. They have got the success and they know how to maintain it. Again, we are talking about leadership roles in all kinds of institutions. So Rahu will do very well here, right? But it has to get the energy from the Ketu. What does Ketu tell here? It is going from Cancer to Cancer, which is all about Moon. So Moon and Saturn. Ketu in Moon as Dispositor, Birth to Navamsha, and Saturn as Dispositor, Natal to Navamsha, Rahu. What the mind wants to achieve and what the heart wants to give permission for. So the heart should be giving the permission to the mind to go forward and achieve. So see where the Saturn and Moon are placed in the natal and Navamsha if this is what you have because it will be very critical and very important to examine what areas of life these people will shine in because they will shine in this. This is a very good nakshatra. And this axis, Punarvasu is going to lose the first time and win the second time and Uttarashada wanting to maintain the victory in that area. You see what I'm saying? So one is failure first, success the second time. The other one is about maintaining success, whatever you have got. So those are the themes that will play out in the Rahu Ketu axis. Now we'll go to the last one. So now we are seeing the first Pada axis. So the first Pada of Uttrashada goes into the third Pada of Punarvasu. Again, this is exalted, but in a very different way. Compare the two tables of Uttarashada and Punarvasu there. The themes of Punarvasu and Uttarashada are same, right? One is losing the first time, winning the second time. Uttarashada wanting, wanting to maintain that victory, which came at a cost, right? But who are the people who know the value of victory? The ones who have struggled, had a failure a number of times, and then they have one victory. They know the value of victory. Not someone who inherited all the wealth. Like let's say the father who set up the business, the company, the corporation with his hard work, struggled against all kinds of odds in the real world. Failure after failure and then succeeding. Punarvasu. And now he knows how to maintain that victory because he has earned it. He or she has earned it through their own efforts. Okay, so... Last, uh, first pada of Uttarashada is Sagittarius going into Sagittarius. So we are talking Jupiter as the dispositor in Natal and Navamsha. Look where Jupiter is falling in the chart. That's the first order of business. <coughs> and the third pada is a Gemini, which is all about Mercury. So Mercury in the Natal and Mercury in Navamsha. So we've got to look at Mercury graduating to Jupiter, meaning even if you want wisdom, you've got to start at the intellectual level, start at the brain level, analytical, log logical reasoning, using the mental faculties. First, use the head that you have, which is Gemini. 
Gemini going into Gemini. So Mercury has to be used to bring that energy towards Sagittarius, which is all about, and it's in the first pada. So it's exalted dharma, by the way. So meaning what? It is desirous to make idealistic change. This Jupiter becomes very idealistic in nature. It's all about good stuff. You know, we have to good, do good things for the planet, for the people, for the society, do good to everyone. But only thinking about that isn't going to help. You need some grounded reality. You need to know how to bring it, intellectual knowledge. So using the intellect, which they have, because it's Mercury very exalted there, you need to f bring that knowledge wherever Mercury is sitting in, whichever house it is sitting in, in birth and in Navamsha, and then get that into the Jupiter, wherever Jupiter is sitting in. So it's like Mercury giving the back-end fuel to Jupiter. It's fueling Jupiter. But it's needed. So Vedic astrology is like this. It's never about one thing to the exclusion of others. It's how you use what you have to bring in what you need to go. The soul is just playing out in this duality, in these two kind of planes. Yes. Okay, so next we will be talking more about Purva Ashada. Rahu in Purva Ashada, which will fall into Punarvasu. Probably going into Ardra. So we'll see that, right? Which is about beginning of the victory stages. Good, so I'll leave you with this much to think about. We can have a look at the other ones of Rahu Ketu as well. If you want to understand nakshatras, there is 27 nakshatra playlist. And keep watching for I'll bring you more stuff later on. Take care. Be safe.